Welcome to the third episode of Leading Tourism's Transition, where today I'm joined by, of course, as usual, Berke Valentin, who has been steering and helping us get through this very challenging topic of how we explore data and sustainability towards a data-driven future when we think about sustainable tourism. And we'll be joined by our guest, Michelle Novotny, the lead data analyst at Clever Places, who will be helping us to get some perspective when it comes to people and how we invest in the right capabilities to help us to achieve those goals. Today, we'll be asking questions such as, do we have enough people? Do we have the right skills? And do we have the right knowledge that exists both within companies and organizations, but also across the wider industry? We'll be looking at how to attract them and how to retain them over the long term. And of course, why is this important when we think not only about sustainability, but about having a sustainable approach to investing in data-driven strategies. And of course, we'll be looking at, is it feasible for every organization across our industry to foster data right at the very heart of its operations? There are many challenges that come up when we discuss this. So without hesitation, let's jump in to that conversation. So welcome back, everybody. It's great to be here with episode three, where we are focusing on how to invest in capability around data. Now, I'm very pleased to be joined once again by Birka Valentin. Great to see you again, Birka. Hi, Nick. Good to be here. And today, tell us a little bit about today's guest, because as I have mentioned on the previous episodes, we've been working together to see who can help frame the topics that we have been tackling in this series. So we're here with Michelle Novatny, and I'm really pleased to have you here, Michelle. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Before we head over and uh, hear a little bit more about yourself, uh, maybe I'll invite Birka just to tell us a little bit about why you think Michelle is a really interesting match for this topic? Yeah, yeah. The uh, the answer is quite quite simple, Nick. I think when um, when we look around the uh, tourism sector right now and who's doing work at the destination level as well in terms of data, um, there are obviously many many people involved nowadays. But um, I, there are probably more men than women, uh, and Michelle, uh, who uh, is working uh, and Michelle will introduce herself, obviously, uh, with more detail um, with the company Clever, uh, a female-led enterprise uh, focusing on data. And I thought that would be a really good contribution to to the topic and a nice nice kickoff as well in, in talking about human resources and the skills needed. So um, that obviously put us uh, the expertise and that she is a female, I thought was a good good start for this one. Well, Michelle, you certainly seem like a very, very driven female leader. So uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Let's uh, help everybody get to know who you are and what brought you to today's podcast. For sure. Thank you so much for having me on today. I'm a recent graduate from the Master of Science and Management program at Toronto Metropolitan University. So I have a background in sort of research and data analytics, uh, specifically within the hospitality and tourism industry. I've worked as a research assistant since 2019, and I've recently come on as the data analyst at Clever Places. Uh, So we're a startup company uh, focused on data insights for DMOs. Uh, Basically, we try to aggregate and integrate all of their tourism insights and data into our easy-to-use dashboard tool. That's great. Well, it certainly sounds like you've got things off to a very, very strong start. So let's first of all talk about capability, because I think this is definitely the topic that we want to get underneath the skin of today. And uh, maybe just before we jump into some of the different angles we need to explore here, for you, why is it so important that DMOs are becoming more and more data driven? Why is this something that they need to absolutely prioritize in their work? Yeah, I think it's really important. For me, it comes down to sort of three R's, which is responsibility, reliability, and relevance. Like in terms of responsibilities, the tourism industry is one of the largest economic sectors worldwide. So we have an enormous impact, both positive and negative, on the environment, our communities, and the economy. So we owe a responsibility to monitor that impact and uh, have an influence there. And uh, data-driven decision-making gives us the tools to do that. 
I think it also comes down to reliability. So with information communication technologies and big data, we're able to make smarter and faster decisions. So we don't have to rely on just past experience and intuition. And then finally, relevance. Uh, so DMOs have often been criticized for their inability to adapt to technological and societal trends. So this offers an opportunity for them to continue to remain relevant in this dynamically evolving tourism landscape. Yeah, and that's the challenge, right? How do you actually remain relevant through evolution of how you approach this, how you incorporate it, and how you develop the right people and the talent and the understanding in order to be able to actually achieve that opportunity? Before we kind of uh, jump into that, Birka, what's your experience been with this? I know you've worked very uh, comprehensively within destinations uh, and also between destinations. So you must have surely seen a really interesting set of differences when it comes to uh, the role that people play in this process. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, if, we, if we're really um, looking at the at the foundation of it all, right, and all of the projects that we, we see in destinations on the data side, but all the others, um, obviously, there are always many, many success factors for those kind of projects. But I do think the common element in all of them are always the people and that it kind of, you know, it succeeds and falls with whoever is behind that. Um, so in, in terms of the data driven aspect, um, when we talk about, uh, strengthening data capacities within destinations, there is, um, it, it's a very noticeable difference if you see in destinations, if there is some staff that knows uh, a little bit more about that topic, than um, if not, um, obviously there is always the, uh, more the traditional capacity of, of, of analyzing kind of the traditional information, um, statistics, for example, that usually you can find, um, but going beyond that, uh, in different destinations, then, then you do see, start to see the differences of who's been able to go, uh, deeper into certain insights, have a broader insight, um, and more different data sources, right. And going into what Michelle was, was mentioning the, the big data sources, for example, um, and that is is also it, it i wouldn't even say it depends much on the country um or on on the destination maybe there's sometimes a, a bit of a cultural part in that one as well but it's more i think of a development um aspect of the dmos as well and what kind of development stage are they in how important this data for them um and how uh the yeah what's the commitment not to to lead with with more evidence and tangible insights and we actually touched on this a little bit in the last episode where we spoke especially about the need to commit to the long term. And that was something that we kind of picked up on as not only a question of investing in projects, resources and plans that can take us really far into the future because data is something we need to build and build and build upon. But I, I think we also mentioned a little bit the people aspect of that as well and looking at how to build and invest in the right people that can take things all the way through to their yeah full potential. So Michelle, turning to you, t tell me a little bit about, you know, why you see people as being key to this, uh, to, to this important kind of goal of transforming how we work as destinations and putting data as the driving force towards destination transformation. Yeah, I think people played such a fundamental role in this uh, change at all different levels. I mean, we need the people that are building this smart tourism infrastructure. So our researchers, our data scientists and analysts, uh, there's those stakeholders that are interacting with this infrastructure, like our tourists and residents and our businesses. And then there's those who are going to leverage this infrastructure to actually make the decisions. So at all different levels, it's it's people and it's having those skills and the, even just the ability to communicate uh, these insights that we're getting. So you're kind of referring here not just to, you know, one key set of skills, which I think maybe also quickly is the assumption that a lot of people would have when you talk about data and you talk about skills, you immediately kind of connect it with, okay, data scientists, um, at people who are very analytical and able to work with the data sets that, you know, are the kind of the baseline of what we're doing. But you're also talking about a, a kind of leadership level as well there then. So the capability of, you know, right up to directors, vice presidents, CEOs, also being comfortable to really talk and work with data. 
I th Nick, I think the um, I mean the topic about the profiles is really important um, because that is I think one of the things we still haven't really gotten around yet. That um, you know we, we talk about data driven destinations, and um, you think oh well, maybe with one two people that that would be enough, right? But if we're really talking about a whole transformation of an entire system, and obviously in that you need some sort of um, at least basic understanding uh, of that kind of, of that kind of insights and how this is uh, being generated, and obviously then you need the specialists, right? Um, at the technical level who are able to do all the different processes of data, which are also not just, you know, looking or getting data, but then the whole cleaning part, the analytical part, and then turning this um, insights that we are finding into stories that are understandable for the non-data <laughs> people from inside and outside the organizations and being able to actually tell that story, um, including correlating different insights, yeah, right? But that requires... Uh, and and even not only the data knowledge, but also then the tourism knowledge, right? And that's that's another then step towards um, where we need to go. Yeah, so we, we kind of often focus on these one or two individuals, but I guess if we look at the, the need, it's really, are we talking about trying to upgrade almost the skills of an entire organization? So everybody who has to work on on everything related to the DMO's direction to be have a kind of level of fluency when it comes to data? Uh, I think there needs to be the individuals within the DMO that have that uh, capacity to analyze the data, but also communicate it within the context of the tourism industry. Um, and I think everyone needs to be able to understand it at some level, but there does need to be those specific individuals that that have that background in data science and analytics. Now, Becca, you kind of spoke about like storytelling data, which I think is, it's a, I think it's something that's quite nice to kind of um, connect with because it it is that human aspect of being able to take something that's quite um, blunt, you know, a set of numbers, and somehow kind of tell the human part that sits behind that. Uh, what does that tell us? How does that impact someone's lives? Uh, how does that impact the experience? And I guess that's uh, that's quite a rare skill, right? Uh, what are, what do we actually look for in in order to find people who can be almost sort of the translators between data and between interpretation and understanding there? Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a multidisciplinary uh, profile, right? We're talking about it's someone who um, doesn't need to have uh, the uh, specific in-depth knowledge of, uh, for example, a data analyst that goes into all the different details um, or someone who then builds uh, the different uh, graphics or maps or whatsoever. But uh, there's someone who needs to understand um, how those things function, um, especially, and w one of the really important thing I think that really help to tell stories is the is a geographical aspect, right? And then we're talking about someone as well that needs to understand maps um, and geographic information and putting that into a kind of a location context. Um, that itself is a huge challenge sometimes. Um, uh, yeah, uh, and so that it's it's a bit of a multidisciplinary um, person, I think that. Um, yeah, requires a bit of everything, but not not in depth, right? And Michelle, you've kind of gone from uh, being a fairly recent graduate um, to having a really key role um, as data analyst at Clever Places, which is a great accomplishment so early on in your career. Uh, so perhaps this gives you a different perspective as well. Um, how, how do you see the development process and the opportunities that are available. Uh, as someone who graduated, did you? What was your experience like when we talk about data? You know, from my perspective, we're talking about something that everybody kind of had to get on board with, teach themselves, learn themselves, and really pursue a genuine sense of curiosity if that isn't their core background. But today, bringing the right talent into the industry, uh, it seems it doesn't require data scientists as such. But it requires, as Rebecca was talking about, this kind of multi multidisciplined uh, skill set. What's your experience been? You know, going through the further education process and then into graduate positions and then up through the ladder. What's what's been great and also what's been missing? 
Yeah, exactly. I think you mentioned it perfectly that it's difficult to find people that have that background in both uh, sort of the analytics and understanding the data process, but that also have that knowledge of the tourism industry because it is quite complex and it's a large industry with a lot of different players. Um, so to be just someone with a background in just data science isn't really enough to come into tourism and really communicate it and tell the story. Um, but then also, are we having enough uh, education at, at the level of our colleges and universities in these tourism programs, uh, giving graduates enough uh, background in data science so they can then go into the industry and apply it? Um, I'd say I, I'm very lucky within my program at the Ted Rogers School of Hospitality and Tourism Management to have courses that were in information technology management, and they built the foundation of those skills. Um, but I was really able to build on them in my master's program where I took a lot of statistics courses that really helped build on that. But, you know, it's also been along the way a lot of uh, just self-taught and learning and mentorships as well uh, within the industry and watching tutorials and videos and, and learning yourself and reading books. Um, so it's got to be a passion as well. You got to have the passion for both the data and the industry. That's a very interesting perspective. I think uh, it's it's uh, one that's quite different to maybe how education and tourism looked, say, 15 years ago or even a little bit longer. And there does seem to be a significant increase in the integration of, of analytical aspects into tourism programs. And this seems to be that it can only really be a good thing for what our industry needs right now, which is perhaps more the comfort and confidence to then take that learning and that level of understanding wherever the intrigue and curiosity kind of brings you. So it's it's also really nice to hear about that kind of self-learning pursuit that then you can kind of take forward based on a genuine passion and interest. Do you think we have the right uh, environment in the industry to kind of embrace that kind of excitement, that curiosity and see people develop and be able to contribute the, these skills and this interest further? I definitely think we have the right passion and drive to do so. I think really the limitation comes down to resources and uh, if DMOs have the capacity to to put money into the training and development and the hiring of these individuals that share those passions. Because um, really, I think DMOs, their responsibilities have expanded so much over the years, but it doesn't seem like their their teams and budgets have necessarily expanded to, rep to re represent those uh, growing responsibilities. So it really comes down to, to those limitations. But I, I've seen that a lot of DMOs want to. Yeah, there certainly seems to be a lot of determination and commitment but how that translates maybe looks a little bit different what's what's your experience of that being Birka? yeah I, th I think one important really important aspect of that and i mean i i agree with michelle you see you see luckily more and more um of those elements being put into the curriculums, right uh, of of our um, educational system you see more and you see passionate people around this um, and the good thing about this is that um there is a lot of self-learning um possible um, really, uh, through the, you know all the digitalized courses uh, nowadays, so you uh, you don't always just depend on on the traditional kind of educational systems, I guess, to give you that. Plus, it's a very kind of dynamic environment that changes so quickly that is really not something you learn and then you're done with it. It's a continuous kind of uh, education of your of yourself, uh, you know. And to keep that, obviously, we need the environments um, within the DMOs as well to help us have the time <laughs> to do that as well, right? That's many times also you get lost in so many daily uh, activities and responsibilities that uh, I've seen one of the challenges and, and destinations is just to give that time also to employees and enable them to, to learn. But then there's also a really big question about how much of the knowledge do we want to internalize in our DMOs and how much can we share with other organizations? Um, how much can we rely on maybe freelancers? And um, how much can we rely on organizations uh, such as the one from, from Michelle? Um, and so it's a, it's a bit of an um, internal, I think, decision-making process that everyone needs to, to make and to see what, what do we need, what, what kind of questions do we want to answer, like we talked about last time, and, and what kind of, how much of that do we want to, to build internally? And that's a strategic decision in the end. 
Yeah, I think that's actually a, a really great point. I mean, we see that one of the biggest issues, uh, and not only in in terms of data and development, but really across the board, and it also includes brand and marketing work, is that destinations have a tendency to outsource huge responsibilities to agencies uh, that they maybe work with for one to two years, and then that changes and changes and changes. And sometimes that can give them really quick wins, really fast results, something very tangible, very presentable. But there often is this lack of continuity and this lack of ownership of the knowledge, of the ideas, of the creativity that goes into that. And we see that uh, those that do really well kind of break that model. They actually internalize that and they make a lot of success alongside a lot of failure in the process. I guess, uh, what do you think is, you know, is the biggest barrier or challenge to trying to switch the mindset to outsourcing these big ideas or big projects to actually, so it seems like almost remodeling operations where everybody is committed to the to the joint kind of development process, uh, whether or not they necessarily know or have the answers to get there. Yeah, I think, I mean, at Clever Places, we're trying to make it more of a partnership with our DMOs rather than them just simply outsourcing it to us. Um, I think it's important to to share, like you said, in that ownership and responsibility of, of what the ultimate goal is of this. So we're not just trying to be third party data analysts for them. We're really trying to be involved in the sourcing of data, trying to find data sources that we can collect that they can't and ones that they can collect that we can't and analyzing that together to try to find what are the, the key performance indicators you really need to measure and why and what's the best way that we can analyze it, visualize it for you um, so that you can really mobilize it and make the best decisions. Um, because, because yeah, you really can't just outsource that and not have any part of it, and then just look at the the dashboard or the output or report that you get. Um, you really need to be involved in the entire process. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a great way of uh, looking at where maybe that sweet spot between working with a partner uh, and doing everything your in in house yourself is. Because as we spoke about at the beginning, there are maybe broad data skills which needs a, almost a complete upgrading of everybody's knowledge and understanding. Perhaps there's even quite specialist areas where those technical skills and knowledge is really required because it's something that concerns the DMO continuously throughout its evolution. But at the same time, there are many areas which are, are kind of somewhere between the two. And it seems like this partnership working approach with uh, contracted partners could presents really interesting opportunities to have a sort of hybrid approach. Do you see that as something or have you experienced that as something that can work on a on a long term basis? Because it seems for that to be viable, it needs to be both, I guess, on the one hand, affordable long term and on the other hand, um, integrated in such a way that it's a trusted partnership for as long as it remains trusted. Yeah, definitely. I think it can be more of a long-term approach because really in, in the end, it does seem to be more affordable for one. Um, for those that don't have the capacity, especially smaller DMOs, to hire on a full uh, data analyst and scientist team on board, they can hire externally, work with these uh, data insights companies. And really, it's just the initial startup costs um, to build these tools. And a lot of it becomes sort of maintenance over time um, and just continuously working on finding the right sources. But but it becomes more of a maintenance than it really does a, a, a high ongoing cost. Um, yeah, and just the partnership, as, as it was mentioned on um, sort of a long-term basis, I think works because you really are involved in take ownership over the, the outcomes and the, the values and the views that the DMO wants as well. Now, that's quite interesting because Birka and Michelle's kind of framed it as uh, something that can work, but it requires that investment still of attitudes, of mindset, of time. And I think maybe also a level of knowledge and understanding from the outset of what you're getting into. There is that initial cost. So I think uh, this must be sometimes challenging for destinations to either understand 
that if you invest at the beginning, you, you, it's something you want to be committed to in the long run, but also to understand why perhaps it's a bigger front end cost uh, and it takes more resources to get something in place rather than something you just kind of outsource a quick analysis and you're kind of done with it. Do you find that if we talk about uh, developing capabilities around data and seeing more confident workforces within DMOs, do you find that from your experience, there are some kind of initial roadblocks or hurdles to overcome to even get to that point? Yeah, I think um, there is, we are, we're in general a bit in a dilemma, no, in, in terms of um, living in a world where we need to deliver quick results, um, where we, where we are, or people are more and more used, stakeholders are more and more used to get answers quickly. Um, building something up from scratch, taking time and having an initial investment in the beginning is something we very rarely see, um, especially in destinations, understandably for, for many reasons, including uh, because it, it does, you know, you're working in a framework of um, many times political uh, framework as well, where you have leadership changing, uh, not just at the organizational level, but then at the um, higher levels, um, for example, at the, at the regional administrative level that ha are supporting those type of projects. And if those are changing on a regular basis, then um, obviously there is a like this repetitive work needed of explaining, convincing, educating, um, and finding the supporters that you need for those type of projects. So that itself is, a, is I think, a big roadblock um, always, um, having that. Um, and then, obviously, it is um, then the fine balance to decide how much you want to have internally and externally, and if you want to have it more internally, uh, or with a great partnership in the long term uh, on the side, um, how do you then attract uh, the people in a sector where we usually don't pay very well uh, at the technical level compared to other uh, industries right now who are all and we are all needing uh, that kind of profiles data profiles um, so there we have um, and there's lots of movement going on right now um, in that world so just being able to attract and retain that talent um, is a big challenge in itself as well now you're both two very successful uh, women who are really making an impact and uh, carving out your own niche space and reputations so I have a huge respect for both of you, but tell us, uh, help us understand a little bit about what this gender balance uh, question looks like if we think about both tourism as an industry, but also then if we nuance down to data uh, as a kind of technology related industry, uh, what's your personal experience been? And I guess what would the, what would your observation be today where there's still a need for, for change and sorry, this is quite a few questions in one, but how, how might we actively work to address that as well? Um, I've been very fortunate to be mentored by and work alongside some remarkable women within the field of tourism and even in data as well. Um, so I think it's really important that we continue to collaborate rather than compete uh, just in general within the industry um, by sharing knowledge, experience, skills and opportunities with each other. Uh, but I think it also starts in our schools. So encouraging girls to join um, data and tech related electives and extracurriculars in our high schools and elementary schools and to take uh, university and college programs that are within hospitality and those courses that are within information technology. And just the way we talk about it in general, um, because these tech jobs and data related jobs do tend to be a bit more male dominated just changing the way that we speak about it in the language to be a bit more gender neutral. Um, so it's more open and uh, marketed towards everybody. Yeah, F from my side, it's, um, I mean, I, I can only support what, what Michelle was just saying. I think it's also, um, besides the gender balance in itself, um, so, so my uh, journey, I guess, to this whole data world was a little bit different than Michelle's, for example, um, because I came in there later, right? I specialized first in, in destination uh, management and in sustainability. Um, and then as time was going, was moving on, because that was already 10 years ago and there wasn't the topic of big data wasn't really a, a part that we talked about it much. It was more statistics uh, and traditional kind of insights. Um, but as time was going on and we had more and more data sources uh, and new data sources, um, being able 
to have, and that doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're, I guess, a female or male, but having the environment where you, when you have that curiosity and you see that this is something you're interested in and that would make sense for you, have the ability to add that skill set to your uh, current skill set, which I think is fundamental and where we are where we're heading because we won't have enough people just coming out of universities and having those skill sets right it's it's a lot about transferring and uh, having people move from one area to the other and just adding to it um, so that itself I think um, I think there are by now many great also programs that focus especially on women um, but but I find it almost much more an issue of uh, especially in the future of um, maybe age even. And, and being able to transfer and, and use skills that have been there before and adapt them to what we need. So two really uh, slightly different perspectives there, but I think uh, quite interesting to see that. And Michelle, from, from your perspective, I think you really talk about the attractiveness of the sector and attractiveness of this as a kind of career path. So really pursuing data and kind of um, being encouraged and being uh yeah seeing the appeal of it seeing seeing that this is actually a really interesting career path to go down and and i guess Birka talking a bit differently there uh it's really interesting to see yeah that perspective about kind of evolving skills and uh, taking sometimes really valuable experience and knowledge and quite intricate understanding and then being able to almost kind of augment that by continuing to grow and continuing to learn. So yeah, these are two really interesting perspectives. Well, if we maybe take as kind of one wrap up point here, uh, what I would love to get your candid opinion on is thinking about DMOs because, you know, we do a lot of work with destinations. We talk a lot about the work that they're doing. And in fact, today we've been talking about how destinations can invest in the right capabilities, whether they're in-sourced or outsourced. Mm -hmm. And what I would love to know from each of you is if destinations can take one bold action to radically change how they approach development and developing people, what action would they take? And Michelle, I'm going to throw maybe a curveball to you to just ask also an additional question. At the moment, you're working in a, a specialized company that's kind of giving you the opportunity to perhaps play and, and really develop in an area that you love. What is missing in a DMO that perhaps doesn't quite make that such a playground that it could be, that it seems like you really enjoy the space you're in right now? And how can a DMO make that environment competitive? So I don't know who wants to go first on that. It's a big question. So you might need a second to think about it. Uh, I can attempt. I'll try to go first. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm a bit biased because I'm coming from the perspective of that external um, data insights company. So I think one big step that DMOs could take is to partner with organizations like Clever Places um, because if you really don't have those resources internally or even if you do, um, these external companies have their own resources, their own um, partnerships with other data sources as well that can really uh, work with any DMO of any size to try to uh, build up their data-driven decision-making processes. So it's really is a partnership working together, and it really can be quite affordable in the long run. Um, but I think if DMOs also do have those internal resources, it's just shifting the priority towards knowledge management, really building that into the responsibilities and the day-to-day -day operations of a DMO, rather than looking at it as an external sort of silo um, or responsibility on the side. And maybe before we head to Birka for the same question, what, what would it take a DMO to create a super attractive workplace for someone who loves data? Um, super attractive workplace. I think there needs to be a lot of opportunities, like Brooke had mentioned earlier, for sort of growth and development and training within that area. So encouraging people that are interested in it within the DMO um, or externally to want to be part of that uh, side of their, their organization. 
Um, and also just offering competitive pay and benefits. Um, Berg also mentioned this, that it can be a bit challenging for some, especially smaller DMOs, um, and to have those resources. But I think that can really make it uh, more of a long-term career path for someone that is within those roles. Um, and I think also the main point would be encouraging these individuals to be part of the entire decision-making process, um, rather than just having them build the lead up to the decisions, have them part of the, the collection, the analysis, the, um, the aggregating the data and the building of these decisions and, and working together as a group rather than just being someone else within the, the organization. They're part of the whole process. Fascinating. I think that that last point in particular, it's uh, maybe goes against the natural, um, the natural feeling for a DMO to maybe take someone in right to that level uh, and see what they can share and what they can bring. And uh, perhaps the kind of stiffness sometimes of that governmental uh, environment makes that quite tricky to be so fluid and so loose about saying, hey, yeah, let's let's see what you can show us and let's let's give it a chance. It's a, yeah, have that kind of flexibility to do that. Very interesting. Thanks, Michelle. So what about from your perspective, Birka? Yeah, I'm, um, I, sh I share the, the aspect with Michelle and saying, you know, be, be realistic enough and know your limits and, and find good partnerships that you can trust over time and that you can build uh, in the long run because no one is going to make it on their own, really, uh, with all the challenges and all the insights we need um, and need to solve. However, I am also a big advocate for building skills internally because I think that gives a certain power in the DMO. Um, obviously, that comes with the challenges of having to keep people in there <laughs> and offering those opportunities that Michelle just said and, you know, being an attractive workplace where you want to stay for a longer time. Um, so there, I think there is a bit of a, of a challenging balance that everyone needs to find. Uh, one really important thing, I think right now we are in a bit of a still in a bit of a trial phase no? of um, everyone is kind of trying their own approach. Um, and so uh, there is a lot of different kind of approaches going on in destinations. And I think one of the really, really important thing is to exchange up to that granular level of, hey, what has worked and what has not worked for you um, with other destinations? Because that uh, we do have conferences and we do have workshops, and but we hardly ever have those really honest conversations about, you know, we've tried this and that didn't work. We tried that and that didn't work. But, you know, we found this to be a hopeful seed of <laughs> continuance in the work, I guess. Um, so that itself, I think those honest conversations, we need to foster much, much more to find that and to help every DMO to find that balance. Um, and I think um, in terms of super attractive workplace, um, besides what Michelle was mentioning, one of the things I think we are not using enough, because what it comes down to, right, all the industries right now are trying to find how they can be the most attractive organizations and how to get that very demanded um, kind of uh, profile. Uh, and so if at one point we're getting to a point where all of the organizations have, for example, they all offer people to work from wherever they want, they give them as much flexibility as they want. No, and we get to this optimum of you can't almost improve the kind of the benefits that you give everyone, what does distinguish our industry compared to a pharmaceutical industry or, you know, to, to whatever automobile or whatever. And that really is tourism, right? We work in one of the most greatest industries in the world and we are not using this as a kind of attracting point to get the experts that we need. Um, because if someone has the ch chance to decide then you know, between a pharmaceutical and a tourism workplace. And yes, maybe we don't, don't pay that much. We need another very important kind of attractive driver that gets those people to us. And um, yeah, I hope which, if we're using that a little bit more in the future, I hope that we'll have a bit of better chance to get that, that talent into our organizations. Yeah, absolutely. And that seems to go as well with, you know, the passion and the excitement about what, you know, the industry we're, we're working in. And even if we touch on some of the aspects related to sustainability and communities and the, the fact that tourism can also improve communities and, and change lives is something that's that can be really motivating. So I think uh, that's a really interesting point. We perhaps almost don't tap into the emotive side of things as well. Well, uh, it's been really interesting discussing this with both of you. 
And I value very much your different perspectives on this because I think we really have kind of these two quite different um, backgrounds that you both are bringing to this. And we see this same topic from different angles. And I think for me that what's been really interesting, especially is to see the the kind of the urgency to develop the internal capabilities and the challenges sometimes in doing that um, for, for reasons which don't always make sense, but DMOs can be slow moving machines, let's put it like that. But also the the opportunity to go quicker, uh, to go quicker within a DMO if the culture's right, but also to be quicker by being smart with partners who can quickly tackle sometimes really complex issues and help us get a much better understanding and perhaps even spark that culture for more internal development. So thank you to both of you. And thanks uh, especially to Birka for guiding us through this three-part series where we've had some fascinating discussions. We've gained a lot of perspective and we've certainly been able to unpackage data from that destination development perspective and see both the opportunity, but the many hurdles and barriers we still need to work to overcome. I guess maybe to give you the the closing word, Birka, what would you say destinations uh, have to do to completely redefine themselves? Should we should we be looking at the marketing and brand role as something that's sort of from the past and a pre-pandemic notion, or do you see this as the future as something completely different and the role of the destination taking on an entirely new purpose? Yeah, thanks, Nick. And uh, thanks in general for taking on all the ideas that that I had and going along with that. Uh, It was a lot of fun so far, those three episodes. Um, It's a big question, um, but it's a a generally very simple question. Yes, I think we all know that we cannot continue the way how we've we've handled uh, and developed our entire system um, until the pandemic. I think um, it is clear that we um, need to move into an entirely completely different model. Um, where we have the social and environmental aspect much higher on the priority list. Um, unfortunately, I don't think that's always entirely up just on the DMO or on the people within the DMO because it does require a complete um, system change, right? And that is um, also where the DMOs get their money from, who is uh, leading those, uh, the stakeholders involved. Um, and so it's it's a big it's a big part uh, to do, um, and I hope we're getting there. I do think we are getting there. I think the change from destination marketing to management organization. I think we're moving into an even further evolution of that management uh, organization. I don't know how we're going to call it in the end, but um, it's definitely going to be different, hopefully, in the future to tackle everything we need. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to you as well, Michelle. It's been great to have your contribution and uh, input on today's discussion. And uh, well, we look forward to continuing this discussion at all of the opportunities that we have in front of us. But I think we should really take note of what we discussed today, which is the need to have these honest conversations. So more honesty and maybe less presenting the story that we want to present and really focusing on yeah, what what have we failed at? And and kind of embedding that principle as perhaps the conversation starter for everything we discuss when it comes to development and the data that we can use to help us understand what's happening. Thanks very much to all of you and see you next time. Well, that brings us to the close of this three-part series. Thank you once again to Birka Valentin for bringing together these three very interesting experts who have helped us to navigate this complex and challenging topic of data and sustainability. And thanks, of course, to Michelle Novotny for providing this really excellent insight on the importance of investing in people, skills and capability, and not only thinking about sustainability, but also thinking about the sustainability of our data-driven approach. This is also a really important question. Well, as we now have reached the close of this three-part series, we look forward to 2023, where we'll be continuing Leading Tourism's transition with some really interesting new series. And we'll be starting off early in the new year with the next series, which will be looking at foresight in tourism, 
how important is it to look forward and to have a sense of vision as we embrace visioneering and we start to imagine perhaps what the future might look like. We'll be joined by Beata Menka. She's a PhD fellow in sustainable tourism development at the University of Southern Denmark, who, as Beata has been guiding us through this last three-part series, Beata will be then guiding us through the next three-part series, where we will be hearing from a new set of perspectives on how foresight can play a really key role as we start to recreate the future for tourism and we start to imagine what positive impact in fact might look like. So thank you for joining and we look forward to bringing you the next series very soon.